One of the things that I love is that two films idea of your life. And there's like two stories you can tell. One that is safe and full of regret, and one that is risky and full of pride and joy. Good afternoon. And you can all say it back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, that makes me feel good. There's a lot of love in this space. Thank you. Um, I'm going to begin with, with a video, and uh, we're going to have a conversation today about a four-letter word that means the world to me, and I have a feeling it means the world to you all as well. Uh, that word is love. We'll start here. Growing up in the 80s in the crack era in Harlem showed me a lot of what the dark side of the world could be. But when you're in a community where everyone is lifting each other up, you see the bright side of things. As a kid growing up in a city like New York, it's very fast paced and if you don't speak up for yourself, you, it's easy to get swept away. And I was actually a really, really shy kid growing up. I was an introvert. Though I was quiet, I was always absorbing. And so I learned a lot of different people's communication styles, what made them tick, what pisses people off, what makes them happy, what gets them to really do. Over time, there were these opportunities that presented themselves. And you know, if you don't learn to speak up for yourself, others will. And you may not like the story that they're telling about you. I found my voice through being present. I think there's something really special about showing up, right? In our lives, so much fear comes up from the things we're like afraid to do or afraid to try. And for me, owning my voice came from feeding my curiosity. You're owning your voice to leave your mark. It's like imagine you're here for 75 years and you never spoke up for anything you believed in or you never shared an idea that you thought could really change something. And I really think that in being here, if we're going to be here, there is a necessity to add value somewhere. And if you're not adding, you're subtracting. So in owning your voice, you create an opportunity for yourself to really leave a mark once you're gone. Is it safe? <laughs> Thanks, that's my time. Um, just kidding. Is it safe to assume that you're all here to own your voice, to leave your mark? Yeah. Yeah. Do you all believe in the power of love? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Um, because now, more than ever, the world needs your love. I'm going to show you a video that breaks my heart, and I have a feeling it'll break yours as well. Um, what you're watching on this screen is the state of what's happening in America right now. It has been quite a challenge to be present in this space over the past few days because what I'm watching in my home is genocide. This year alone, police have murdered 137 people of color in America. Unarmed, who have not committed a crime, uh, there is a war on people who look like me. And so the urgency of love I have felt in my life right now is no bigger than it's been in this moment. And I'm leaning on all of you as well to feel the need for that love too. 137. On my flight boarding here to Wales, I was very excited. I've been counting down three years for the opportunity to speak at Due. And I learned about Alton Sterling on my way here. A man with a family and children who was murdered for selling CDs by the police. Literally 24 hours after we landed, I got news from back home that another African-American man was murdered, Philando Castile. He was in a car with his family and was murdered for a busted taillight. This is the reality of the world that we live in. And being a person who believes in the power of love, sometimes it is very challenging to show up in love when what your reality is seeing is that people are going out of their way to dehumanize, destroy, and silence people who look like you. The beauty of that darkness is, though, that I'm not afraid. And I hope you aren't either. Because it's going to take a world to end 
this kind of harm. And so the conversation that I want to have with you all today is about love. My work has been fueled by nothing more than the power of love and honoring the power of choice. And what I'll share with you is from my journey, these guiding principles that have kept me along the way in, in leading with love and standing in love and being the brightest light that I can be in all that I do. The first is listen and decide. Step one. My journey starts here. I'm the cute one in the stroller with the pumpkin. <laughs> Emphasis on, we're all cute. I'm the cute baby one. Uh, I grew up in New York City, born and raised, and I was exposed to do two very, very interesting things at a young age, darkness and light. I watched my parents essentially fight for their lives all my life. They were addicted to drugs, uh, my mom cocaine, my dad crack. And so as I referenced in, in the video, growing up in the 80s in that era, uh, you get to see a very, very dark side of the world. Um, and you also get a choice. And I am tremendously grateful for the love of, of my family, of my siblings, of my mom for being the fighter that she is, and my dad as well. Um, because in that darkness, I had a choice. And the beauty of darkness is that it teaches us several things. It teaches us how to fight like hell. It teaches us resilience. And it teaches us that there's an opposite to that. Um, and I learned that that thing was love. And so at a very young age, I decided I was going to fight like hell for love and everything that I do. And I don't mean love the noun, you know, the cute noun. Uh, I mean love the, the verb, the action, the act of showing up with so much courage, so much empathy, so much joy, so much kindness, so much light, that no matter how much darkness showed up, I was going to find the light on the other side. And so at five, somehow I felt there, there's this hope and I'm going to keep pushing because there's more on the other side of that. And that has driven everything I do. And there's a learning that happens through that process. So step two is learn. Learning is one of the most important parts of love and how we show up in love. So for me, I was a super introverted kid. I had a third grade teacher who would call on me. I remember Miss Smith. And I would not share ever, like, Ms. Smith, stop calling on me. It's, this is not going to happen. I really like to observe the world around me, um, what makes people tick, what really inspires them to move. And I learned all of these different elements of good communication and what it looks like, um, and poor communication and what it looks like. And at the heart of it, the communication that worked best was the kind that was rooted in some type of love. And I leaned on that. And I didn't know it at the time. And I'm sure you all will resonate with this as well but your past grooms you for your purpose. So throughout my entire childhood, I'm experiencing all these things. I've lived in battered women's shelters with my family. I've, I've lived in poverty in Harlem. Um, I've used food stamps, and we've lived off of, off of very little. Um, but the little that we had was all that we needed in the moment. And in having that little, I was able to see what it looks like when community comes together. So there was darkness, and there was always light. And I stayed as close to the light as I possibly could. So that learning really helped groom me into the place that I'm in. And along that learning, I realized what my vessel was. And for me, that became voice. Now, as a really shy kid, imagine third grade, Miss Smith would ask me every damn day. Miss Smith asked me every day to share with the class. And I was like, no, Miss Smith, I'm not going to do it. I would scribble my answers on paper and like slide it over to her. And I remember the one day I did share, my first poem was a poem about love. It was super corny, super cheesy. But I remember it like it was yesterday. And I stood up in front of my class and I said, love is something you should share. Love is not when you don't care. Love is something you should do. People spread love just for you. It's not fair when you're not right. Then people want to fight. You should show love to everyone. Then life will be just plain fun. And so in third grade, I had this concept of like love. It's powerful. It moves us. It's, it makes life fun. Um, and that guided me. Again, it guided me through everything. And that was my first taste of what voice could do. And what I realized in growing up and being shy is that sometimes life will thrust you into leadership positions that make you own your voice. Um, and what really changed my life was growing up on the debate team and on the basketball team. I was the captain of both. And through that, I learned how to form arguments, how to really get under people's skin, how to love them into directions that I wanted them to move, how to persuade them. Um, and it helped me really hone my voice. And so when I was in a position going into college, a very defining moment for me, I was involved in a grade-changing scandal in my school. I was the star player on my basketball team. We were undefeated. I failed economics. 
make sure you tell your kids to study, please. Um, so I failed the economics class, and uh, my principal had a gathering in his com conference room, and he told my economics teacher to change the grade. And I spoke up and said, you know, we've just got a couple games to play until the next semester. It'll be fine. Um, I can keep, I can just, you know, pass my classes and we'll move on. And he said, no, 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 it's fine. Change the grade. A few weeks pass. We've got an undefeated season. We're almost headed to the championship. We get a call. Um, we just got a heads up that someone's been playing ineligibly. So all of the games that we'd played with me failing that economics class, we had to forfeit. And we missed the playoffs by one slot. And I found out in the end that our principal <clears throat> was nervous about getting caught. And so he blew the whistle on our team. And that was my, my dream of, of winning the championship that season. A very interesting thing that happened that catapulted me even further into the work of communication was uh, my coach called our local newspaper, the New York Daily News, and he talked to them about what had happened. And I got a call from a reporter and he said, do you want to share your story? And my mom said, I'll support you in whatever you want to do. And so we did. We told the story about what happened. And as a young person, I learned um, my voice does matter. My voice does count. It is a big deal uh, to honor and own your voice. And so that story ended up being a cover page story, which I didn't know and I wasn't prepared for. And sometimes when you own your voice, you've got to be ready for what comes next. And I realized how powerful voice was as my vessel. But in this learning process that I'm doing, I also realized that our traditional schooling does not prepare our young people to command their voices, to own their ideas, to champion for themselves. So I realized a gap in the system. And it groomed me. I went on to college and studied communications. And I really had a knack for it. I really loved it. I studied television and radio. And it prepared me for, it's another important piece of love, is leap. Number three. So when I graduated college, I moved into a space where I was like, I want to be a radio personality. And the one thing that fueled me through all the trauma I may have experienced in my life is curiosity. You know, when a dream settles into your spirit, I'm sure you can all attest to having the visions that continue to flood your mind of what's possible if you do it. And after long, those dreams nudge you far enough where you're like, the only choice I have is to dive headfirst into everything that terrifies me. And so I did. And that's love. Love is over fear. And so in taking these leaps and graduating college and studying radio and deciding I want to be a radio personality, I pursued that dream hard. And along those lines, the three things I've always been passionate about are education, food, and music. And <clears throat> in doing radio, I realized I wasn't fulfilled. And I wanted to find a way to combine all of these interests. How can I do that? And something interesting happened. I have an older sister and my oldest niece, who's 18 now. My sister told me, um, Tabitha has a learning disability. And I remember feeling so hurt and so frustrated um, and so sad. And I was like, what can I do about it? I've always asked myself this question. Um, what can you do about it? And so I decided I'm going to start tutoring. I put up an ad on Craigslist. <laughs> and I was like, does anyone need a tutor for your children? I am here. Um, and I worked with my niece to tutor her. And I realized I really appreciated education uh, and the power um, that we have when we learn and how powerful we can be with what knowledge we attain. And so through that process, I was like, how do I take my love of education and, and culture and music and use it for something good? And for the first time in my life, I took one of the biggest leaps that I ever would take. I had no interest in becoming an entrepreneur, ever. If you would have asked me 10 years ago, I said, I don't want to run my own business. I don't want to be anybody's boss. And uh, there's a funny saying that man plans and God laughs. And so he was laughing pretty hard when this leap happened. And what I ended up doing was creating something called the Hall Pass Tour with some of my friends. I believe that the best way to build is in love and with community. And so we decided that we were going to go to high schools and produce concerts themed around getting students excited about carving out their own learning paths to pursue their dreams. And so I recruited my squad. And this is the team. And our intent was pretty simple. We're going to go to schools. We've got a headlining singer. We've got a headlining MC, we've got a photographer, we've got a DJ, and we've got a hype man, and I'll be the host. And we're going to go into schools and turn that shit into Madison Square Garden. And we were like, but what would make students want to see us perform? It's like they need to be a part of the magic, a part of the equation. And so we decided with every concert we do, students will be the opening acts. And they won't just be opening acts. When you take the stage, you have to share what your dreams are and how you think some form of higher learning can help you get there. And that was our start. 
And we were like, okay, what more can we do? And so we decided students need to plan these concerts. And so at every school we went to, we had a student ambassador team who helped to plan and execute their own concert. And the intent was, if you can plant a seed of hope and dreams in a community, they'll flourish on their own. And the results are pretty beautiful. And I'll admit, we didn't know what we were doing. I was just like, I know how to host, and I know how to move in love, and we're going to start with that. And so we took the idea to an organization who worked with about 500 schools. And uh, <laughs> this guy said a couple words that changed the game. He said, sounds great, do it. And we're like, oh, do it? OK, let's, let's do it. And so we set off to five schools in New York City to begin. And it was hard. The first concert went super well. And the second concert, there were about six people there. And the third concert went really well. And so we continued to move that energy forward. And it was a beautiful feeling. And five concerts turned into concerts of 50 students. Then we got the opportunity to work with 5,000 students in different arenas. And we traveled the country to about 25 schools and reached 20,000 students. And uh, we're in a space now where we're taking it to the 2.0 version of the tour. And so next year, we'll be rolling out a version where we now embed a community caucus. Because sometimes you can plant a seed, and people need the right resources to nurture it. And so we bring administrators and students and schools to the table to say, here's what can happen next. Here's your plan of action. And through that learning, I realized I really like to coach students on stage. I really like the process of helping people own their voice. And I ended up starting Oratory Glory, again, an accident. I did not want to be in business. Um, but I know I love to serve, and I know I love to love. And so Oratory Glory exists to help people own their voices to really make waves in the world. And we work with companies and schools and entrepreneurs who are looking to shake shit up within the arts, education, and tech. And we can talk more about what that looks like if you're interested. And so from Oratory Glory, the biggest lesson I learned was lift up. In love, you must lift people up. And so one of the biggest things we did was thought about what are the missing pieces. And I remembered in school where there was no place for me to own my voice outside of the debate team and the basketball team. And one of the biggest things we've done as of recently is we've created a course called Be Heard. And it's essentially a course for high school and college students that teaches them all the things they need to communicate well within and outside of the classroom. That's the lift up. The challenging part, though, about love is to lean in, to ask those uncomfortable questions, the things that get under people's skin, the things you have to call people out for, the things that bring you closer to who you are, the lean in. And I had an interesting conversation with Mark in February, Mark Shaler. I was terrified about what I was going to do next. And he said a couple words to me that changed my life. He said, take your foot off the brake. And I realized in that moment, I've been the thing that holds me back. And self-sabotage is a very interesting way of washing you with waves of self-doubt. Um, but you find your way to the light anyway. And since then, I formed a team. I only do work that makes me feel good and fun. And with the Hall Pass Tour, we're moving into a residency program to help us dismantle and reiterate what it looks like to produce this tour. And through Oratory Glory, we've decided we're going to take it to the tech space and build an app. What would it look like to curate an opportunity for people to assess their communication strengths and weaknesses and have tools to actually get better? <coughs> so that's the lean in. I lean into everything that makes me feel uncomfortable. But the most important component of love is to see and to surrender. Surrender to the stuff that terrifies you. Surrender to the stuff that makes you so uncomfortable. Surrender to the stuff that burns you up at your core and see. By a show of hands, how many of you feel good when you're seen, when somebody really acknowledges and honors you and knows you? That's love, seeing and surrendering. And I urge you all to do that in whatever is next for you. Um, because in the end, we choose. We choose what mountains we'll climb or carry, what injustices we'll turn a blind eye to. We choose how our past informs our future and what we'll do with the beautiful moments in between. And most importantly, we choose what contribution we'll make to the world. What contribution we'll make to the world? What contribution we'll make to the world? And so I leave you with three very important questions, because with love as your compass, you're always going to end up exactly where you belong. So what will you choose? How will you love? And if you haven't already, when will you start? Because the world needs your light now more than ever. And there's no better time 
than this moment before us. Thank you.